Welcome and hello. I am Karima Edwards and I am the owner and principal at Hummingbird Community Cooperation, which is a small consultant firm that is focused on capacity building and community building for small businesses and organizations specific to elevating equity and also including and supporting BIPOC communities. And I have with me today my wonderful counterpart, Casey Tonnelly. Casey, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Karima. My name is Casey Tonnelly of Beyond Thinking, an anti-racist coaching and facilitation practice. I have a tendency to work with white folks who are looking to deepen their analysis, deepen their understanding of their behaviors and privileges, and how to show up in better solidarity for the work that folks of color are leading. Thank you, Casey. So I'm excited about this video that we're doing today. This video is focused on bystander intervention. And what we're gonna do is go through some ways that would empower you to interrupt harassing the behavior when it's observed and look at ways to recognize that behavior and ways to also think about how you can make your garden space an inclusive space, but also a safe space. So why do we need to talk about bystander intervention? Part of that is thinking about you intervene when you are witnessing or hearing a harm occurring. So what counts as harassment? Harassment can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen over email, it can happen over the phone, it can happen in person, it can happen in privacy, but as well as in public. And it absolutely can happen in the community gardens. As we have heard from our BIPOC affinity space, folks are experiencing these kinds of harms. And and that can include things like intimidating looks or stares. And that's something that's really important to notice too, because there's subtlety, right? Frequently when somebody says like, somebody's staring at me, think about a time you've been stared at and how did that feel? But who do you turn to? How do you prove the feeling of that experience? And so really noticing not only if you see somebody staring at somebody else or providing intimidating looks, or if you've done it, if you have stared at somebody because you're not sure and you haven't met them before. These looks are also forms of harassment. And so it can come through intimidating looks and staring. There might be comments about somebody's physicality or their appearance, which is just never appropriate. And there's vulgar gestures as well. And this has a huge spectrum of what counts as vulgar. And usually when we think about a vulgar gesture or language, the person who is on the receiving end, they are the one who gets to decide what the impact of that was. Following somebody else. Another thing that we've heard is that there's policing and surveillance that's happening of other gardeners or community members. So following somebody is never appropriate. It's a little stalkerish and it's a little bit of hypervigilance. And so watching like, why are you following somebody? Is there really a need for that? And really, I just recommend don't do it. The other thing is there might be racist, xenophobic, homophobic, sexist, or transphobic language being used or behaviors being used. And I think one of the things to note is we as individuals may not always know what's the origin of our statements or our language. And so when you receive feedback about phrases or language or terms that are being used, if it's shared with you that it is racist, xenophobic, homophobic, sexist, or transphobic, listen, there's a lot of phrases in the human language, <laughs> English language, that have origins of real harm and real pain. And so just because something has been absorbed into mainstream society doesn't actually reduce the harm that's experienced by the person who's being impacted by those words or those phrases. So as Casey mentioned, there's a lot that can be defined as harassment. There are a lot of ways that people can make, be made to feel harmed or emotionally distressed. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how to interrupt that type of behavior. But before we do that, I want us to have an understanding of what is public space. I have public space for all because is it one of the things that we'll talk about is the historical context of how people have experienced public space. So what is public space? Public space, the idea of public space is that it's supposed to be a place that's open and accessible to all people. So some examples would be the roads, the sidewalks, public squares and parks, beaches, sometimes offices, and definitely community gardens. As I mentioned, historically, those spaces have not always been open to everyone. And historically, 
obviously there have been harmful rules and laws and things that have happened in these spaces. Some of the things that have impacted particularly black and brown people have been segregation and Jim Crow laws, forced removal, internments, forced labor, and things like redlining that still in some forms exist. So when we think about public space and we think about it in the context of historically minoritized community members, public space is not always experienced the same way. A lot of times people who are black and brown can feel uncomfortable in public spaces and also made to feel, feel like they do not belong. So what role does the community garden play in reclaiming that space? One thing that you as a gardener can do is make sure that that space is somewhere that people of all backgrounds can feel welcome. And it's a place that people should be able to have peaceful enjoyment no matter who they are in that space. So we're gonna move on to talk about how we can do some things to make sure that that peaceful, open, and welcoming space is sustained and not interrupted by harassing behavior. So we're living through a time period where there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of hypervigilance, and there's a lot of harm experienced through, as we go throughout our day. But today we're going to focus a little bit on common reasons for not taking action in general, but also specifically in garden space. Knowing that disproportionately Black and Brown folks are experiencing the harm and trauma trauma at a much more severe rate than those of us without that racial identity. So a lot of times people are looking to other folks, right? And so if they're not seeing other people jump in, then they're like, Ooh, maybe I don't need to jump. There's a lot of anxiety and fear of making things worse. But I do think that's what message does that say to somebody if there's a witness who doesn't intervene, right? So by not saying anything, that also makes it worse. So you might make it worse with your language or words, but if part of your desire desire is to intervene, that's a better risk to take than silence. Questioning your own judgment about how serious the situation is. This is a very simplistic phrase, but feel the funk. If you are feeling the funk, I guarantee other people are feeling the funk. And so therefore, like if you are feeling it and there's something in your gut that's saying what's happening is not okay, take a risk, lean into that. Kareem is going to walk us through a little bit about ways to center the person who's experiencing the harm versus focusing on the person who might be causing the harm. Believing that you can't change things. I love the Alice Walker quote of the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. And so I encourage you that in those moments, you do. You not just have the power, but you also have responsibility as a community member, as a human, as a fellow gardener, that like those are moments where you do have an opportunity to impact and make a change or at least reduce the harm. Believing that it's not your business. I think this is a really tricky one when it comes to gardening space because some folks are feeling like if they don't know somebody, it is their business to interrogate or to question or to judge what people are doing when they approach the shed. This is a little bit different. When you see harm and it's happening in your community or to a community member, it is your business. And so I think that like just deciphering that distinction of when it's your business and when it's not. So as Karima mentioned earlier, or maybe in a different video, it's not your business what seeds people are planting or what the they're growing. It's not your business what techniques they're using to flourish their garden space. It's not your business to interrogate somebody if you think they do or don't belong. It is your business when your garden is a place that's fostering harm for folks. And so recognizing too that there's both power and responsibility to both be intervening when you're witnessing harmful events, whether that be language, behavior, or communication. So Kareem is going to walk us through the, the next important slide. And I just want you to take a moment to think about how can you show up to intervene harm? So you can show up and you can intervene. And we're going to talk about the five D's of bystander intervention. As Casey just mentioned, there's been a lot going on in our world for the past couple of years. We've been in this pandemic. Unfortunately, out of this pandemic has arisen more fear. And particularly for our Asian community members, there's been quite Quite a bit of harassment that we're now aware of. Well, this video was created to address the harassment that was being experienced and still is being experienced by many Asians in our community. So this video will walk you through the five Ds and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, Asian Americans have faced an alarming rise in hate incidents. Many of the victims are also some of the most vulnerable and defenseless. So what can you do to help? One way is through bystander intervention, 
a set of tools that can prevent verbal harassment from escalating into violence. Here are the five D's of bystander intervention. Number one, distract. Take an indirect approach. Start a conversation with the aggressor or draw attention away from the victim. Number two, delegate. Get help from somebody else. Find a person in a position of authority nearby and ask them for assistance. Number three, delay. After the incident is over, check in with the victim. Ask if they're all right or if they need you to take them somewhere. Number four, direct. After assessing your safety, speak up. Tell the aggressor to leave the victim alone in a firm and clear voice. Number five, document. Record a video of the incident at a safe distance. Film signs or landmarks to identify the location and say the date and time. Make sure you have the victim's permission before posting any footage online. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Let's start today. Learn more at advancingjustice.org. So as you can see, these are some helpful tips that center the victim who's experiencing the harassment. And just to go through it again, you can use these tools. You can distract. What are some ways you can distract? You can spill your coffee, which I love that idea. You can walk between the folks that are having experiencing this. You can make a loud noise. You can drop something. But the idea is to distract the aggressor from and interrupt the harassment. You can also delegate, which is just essentially going to someone else and asking for help. So if you see others standing around if you're in the garden space and you see other gardeners around it's okay to say hey that person is being harassed hey this is inappropriate what I've witnessed can you come and help me one of the other D's was delay so maybe it's just wait out the situation if it's not imminently dangerous and then go to the person later and say hey how can I help you and this centers them because then they let you know how you can help you can say I saw what happened I don't think it was okay what can I do to support you the fourth D, direct. That just means you get in there and you say, this is not okay. It's a very direct, brave approach. If you feel safe in doing so, it's good to say, this is not appropriate. I want you to stop. This is not okay. And the last step D is for document. And we saw a lot of this over the past couple of years where people in the community have felt empowered to record what's going on with their phones or other ways of documenting things. And as the video recommended, you can either document it with your phone from a safe distance, but you can also make Make sure that you're capturing certain landmarks so that it gives the experience context if legal action needs to be taken. So what I love about these tools is that it really does move folks from a place of helplessness because I know personally I have felt helpless before when I've seen people experiencing something that I know is not okay, multiple forms of harassment, but it empowers us to say, okay, we can do something and we can make a difference. I appreciate that so much, Rima, is that like, that's so clear. It's so clear that there are multiple ways to intervene, to engage, and to stop harm that might be occurring. The other thing that I think about you is follow the lead of the person who has been experiencing the harm. Sometimes there's folks who their first thing they want to do is call the police or call somebody for help. And I want to encourage you to check in with the person who's on the receiving end of the harm first before doing something like that. Because too frequently, as we've seen, sometimes the person who's on the receiving end of the harm, when they're engaging with law enforcement, might be seen as an equal contributor to the harm that occurred. And that's just not the case. As well as there are communities that do, for very good reason, have mistrust of law enforcement. And so be sure to check in on the person before assuming that that's appropriate way to go or that that honors their experience. So we encourage you to take a pause, take a pause. You can pause this video and just take a moment to reflect on what power do you have to prevent any form of harassment you might see, witness, or experience in garden space. So we want to thank you for being part of this video today, and we hope that you've learned something that can help make your garden space more welcoming and safe for everyone. If you have any questions, you can reach us at the links on the slide. You can contact myself at my email and you can contact Casey as well at their email, which is also available. And we are happy to answer any additional questions and point you to additional resources that you might want. Yeah, I just want to thank 
thank I mean, you, Karima, for joining me in this training, as well as for folks who are watching. It's up to all of us. We all have a responsibility to create the kind of environment where people see, feel safe, seen, and valued for their full identity. And so just think about where is it that you can step up or step in and take some ownership of, of creating that environment for all. We hope that you continue to watch the videos in the learning library. Please download the handouts that are available to you. And we look forward to, to continue this work with you.